the domino meme for all of this might actually be like prediction market traders, which no, 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 no. The domino, the beginning domino was Polygon's BD team. No, that is the beginning domino. Polygon's BD team is what created good crypto policy in the U S no, I, I just want, I just am saying this more because like, I think if you read the Democrat tweets and social media, it's like a completely divorced set of numbers that they both are citing for why they're going to win. And the, 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 the right really loves citing prediction markets. And and I think that that's a bigger difference than last, even last election. I don't think it was. So so it's like you're, you're almost imagining it's like reverse causality, where it's like um, okay, like an incremental dollar pushing the odds of Trump up on poly market make Trump more pro crypto, which therefore sort of builds support amongst the base. It's the future of lobbying. We started with the future of finance, and we ended up with the future of lobbying. Well, we can't prove or disprove this theory, but I will no. just say, it's not a completely unsound theory. There's some <laughs> grain of truth. <laughs> you guys are a good team. Not a dividend. It's a tale of two fun. Now, your losses are on someone else's balance sheet. Generally speaking, airdrops are kind of pointless anyways. Um, um, unnamed trading know. firms who are very involved. Um, I like that ETH is the ultimate problem. DeFi protocols are the antidote to this problem. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chopping Block. Every couple of weeks, the four of us get together and give the industry insider's perspective on the crypto topics of the day. So quick intros. First, we got Tom, the DeFi maven and master of memes. Hello, everyone. Next, we got Robert, the crypto connoisseur and czar of Superstate. Good morning. And we've got Tarun, the giga brain and grand poobah at Gauntlet. Yo. And finally, I'm Hasib, the head hype man at Dragonfly. So we are early stage investors in crypto, but I want to caveat that nothing we say here is investment advice, legal advice, or even life advice. Please see Chopping Block that XYZ for more disclosures. So uh, it's a good week for the good guys. There's a lot of anticipation right now in the markets about an Ether ETF, and that is sending markets skyward. But there's a lot to talk about this week because uh, it seems like the regulatory and legal picture for crypto has gotten more complicated, and there's a couple crazy stories that I want to make sure that we cover. So we're going to jump right into it. So first up, before we get to the Ether ETF, we have to talk about SAB 121. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of scaffolding just so people understand what we're even talking about. So what is SAB 121? Um, an SAB is a staff accounting bulletin. This is a, a, a bulletin, a piece of guidance that the SEC gives on various different things that they think people should do. It's not a rule. It's just kind of informal guidance. Okay. So in March of 2023, after FTX collapsed, uh, the SEC gave this guidance, SAB 121, that basically said, if you are an entity that is safeguarding crypto assets, like a bank, like a custodian, um, you can have this on your balance sheet as a liability but you cannot have it as an asset, okay? So this means if you're custodying a commodity, if you're custodying a painting, if you're custodying uh, you know, money on behalf of somebody else, it is both an asset on your balance sheet and a liability. But for some reason, crypto, according to the SEC, is special. Crypto is the only thing that if you're a bank, it is only a liability asset on your balance sheet. It is never an asset. If it's not an asset, then that means if you want to custody crypto on somebody else's behalf and you're a bank, then you have to have offsetting additional cash or additional equity uh, against that because of all the you know, prudential requirements for banks. So this effectively was a backdoor way of preventing banks to act as custodians or to custody digital assets, which means implicitly that you know, this is widely perceived as being the SEC taking a shot at crypto and trying to you know, cordon it off from the, from the regulated banking system, which also means that if you want to custody your assets with anybody in crypto, it has to be a Coinbase or somebody who's not a regulated financial player, which kind of benefits the Coinbases and Anchorages of the world. Okay, so this was SAB 121. Many people in the industry complained about this, as well as people in the banking sector who were like, hey, I want to get into crypto and I can't. Okay, then uh, in February, so just a couple months ago, uh, SAB 121 was brought into the House of Representatives, one branch of Congress, which basically said, hey, this rule kind of sucks. This seems not good for the financial markets, right? We've already approved the Bitcoin ETF, but still we have this weird rule that banks are not allowed to hold Bitcoin as an asset on the balance sheet. Let's overturn this, okay? This was somewhat contentious within Congress. It ultimately passed in the House, and people assumed that this was going to fail in the Senate because ultimately repealing guidance given by the SEC is a pretty extraordinary move. It happens sometimes, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty strong censure of what's being done by a regulatory agency that's supposed to be under Congress's supervision. So... Biden then said on May 8th under an executive order that, hey, uh, or sorry, a, 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 what is it, a guidance from the executive branch or something, that uh, if 
this, uh, if this resolution, which is you know basically repealing this uh, security uh, bulletin, gets or sorry, the security accounting bulletin, if this gets passed, he is going to veto it, basically saying Democrats get in line. President doesn't like this. Do not approve this thing. Okay, and and then that occurred. The that occurred prior to the House vote, actually. Yes, this this occurred. Oh, I'm sorry, this occurred prior to the House vote. So it passes the House, which is Republican controlled. So people are like, oh, okay, well, pass the House, probably nothing burger. You know, it's going to die in the Senate. Goes to the Senate and it passes the Senate, sixty to thirty eight, meaning that the Senate is is Democrat controlled. So this is a bipartisan repeal and censure of the SEC in front of both houses now of Congress. So. This feels like, so, I mean, this, this kind of sounds like maybe inside politics, people are like, okay, why does this matter? This all sounds very obscure. Um, and of course, the president has said he's going to veto this. So this is still going to be non-trivial to actually get this thing passed. But it feels like this is presaging something very important that has changed in the air about crypto, which is one, crypto seems to now be bipartisan, this idea that the SEC has overstepped its bounds. And, you know, the, the executive branch is playing too hard against crypto. Second, crypto is now getting political. We talked about this a little bit on the last show, but it seems like the air is starting to change, that this is an issue, that it's not going to be a defining issue of the presidency, but it's an issue that is in play. The way I put it last week, it's a it's a pawn on the chessboard. It's not a rook, it's not a queen, but it, in the last election, it didn't matter. Now it seems like it really does. And SAB seems to be the first uh, inkling that this thing is going to play in, in uh, politics now. Um, so I don't know, it, it might be difficult for people to grasp why this is a big deal, but this feels like to most people, a big deal. Robert, do you have a perspective on kind of framing how this matters? Yeah, I have a few perspectives. Uh, the first to touch on is just that SAB 121, as you briefly touched on, is absolutely terrible, toxic guidance by a regulator. You know, the SEC is not a banking regulator. They're not FASB, which sets like accounting guidelines. You know, they are a securities regulator. And through that position of securities regulator, they way overstepped their mandate, like they've been doing with crypto, you know, in the aggregate, way outside of their mandate to use the tools they have to make an attack against crypto. And, you know, this repeal of 121 was supported by banks and crypto. And Republicans and Democrats, because fundamentally it's just bad policy. It's malicious, you know, zero upside policy. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we saw such broad support for repealing SAB 121. And what was most exciting about that is that, you know, this happened in spite of President Biden's threat and veto, you know. The administration in the executive branch has really been latching onto their power when it comes to taking a stand against crypto. And in some ways, this is now a fight between Congress and the executive branch over you know, crypto policy in the US. And the reason fundamentally why the executive branch has any role here at all is because there's been an absolute void of legislation since... 2009 <laughs> when it comes to crypto. The SAB 121 repeal is the first standalone crypto legislation that's ever been voted on. There has been clauses that have been inserted into other bills that clearly people are voting on it on like, you know, a major legislation focus, not on a crypto specific focus. This was standalone crypto legislation. It's the first time we've ever seen most House members or senators voting specifically on a crypto and a crypto only bill. And it's the first bellwether we've had for like, where is crypto going in the US? And, you know, as you touched upon, the result is shockingly positive in that there's broad, beyond expectations, bipartisan support for good crypto policy legislation. And the response to that is what's even more inspiring. It's the response to that very quickly snowballed into FIT21 and the central bank digital currency, you know, repeal legislation and a num number of pieces of legislation, you know, snowballing in the House once the House observed this incredible bipartisan support for sound crypto-specific policy. And so it's been a monster of a week. You know, some sometimes it feels like a, a year where multiple years happens in just a short amount of time. In a lot of ways, that feels like what's happening. And 
you know, it dovetails and coincides with this rising crypto, you know, political grassroots movement. And I think everyone is just waking up to the fact that like now is the time to be smart about this. Yeah. I, I think the the line that I drew, so I remember when SAB 121, uh, I was I was literally watching the speeches because I was just it was it was kind of like you said, you know, we talk a lot about crypto's legal status in the US, and people forget that there's literally never been a single bill passed about crypto ever. Bitcoin has existed now for more than 10 years. And there's not been a single law passed singularly about crypto ever. So the first time that we see people not grandstanding, not like, you know, pandering to, you know, the, the, the cameras or whatever, but actually voting, we see actually that like, hey, people are trying to be pretty reasonable within Congress. Like when they know their electorate is watching what they're doing, they're not single-handedly saying, look, all this stuff is bad and crypto needs to go out the window, even on the Democrat side when the president has very clearly signaled his allegiances. So I suspect very strongly that SAB 121 is what caused the reversal in the fortunes for the, the Ether ETF. And like, it's not, not, not that it in and of itself caused it, but that it, was, it caused everyone to look around and to notice, oh shit, a lot of people care about this. And it's almost a kind of preference falsification where people look around and they realize like, oh, uh, everybody else seems to also be uncomfortable with the status quo and also seems to think like, hey, we shouldn't kind of just like lemmings fall off this cliff of being anti-crypto just for the sake of showing our allegiance to, to the executive branch because it's not popular. It's not good politics. Like our, our, our uh, uh, constituencies don't like us doing this and just banging on crypto incessantly. Yeah, there's 40 million people that support crypto, and there's like a thousand people that are in government <laughs> and academia who don't like it. So, you know, up until this point, you know, the administration probably has only heard from those thousand people. Okay, I have a, I have a funny thought experiment for you, given that I'm, I have the least uh, regulatory context or interest in a lot of ways, uh, which is suppose meme coins didn't happen, didn't take off last year between November and February. How much would that have changed the number of Democrats who flipped? Because like, I feel like actually the average constituent who would have been annoyed was the meme coin trader, to be totally honest. And like, I, I, I think about Why? this thought experiment of the counterfactual of like, they didn't exist. They hold didn't on, call. To be clear, if you are a meme coin trader, your bank you is don't not care about in your crypto. Yeah, exactly. You don't care about, <laughs> like, yeah. No banks are I, I, think, I, th I, think, I think the thing is like, Let's put it this way. I, I, every single wallet or app I had on my phone today sent me a notification to call my congressperson uh, for this Fit21 thing. And all I have to say is I, 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 I think the meme coin growth actually helps that cause. I see what you're saying. You're saying there's a lot more active participants over the last couple months than had meme coins not yeah, taken off I, again. And they would be willing to, you know, call their senator or whatever and be more active because they have a lot more stake in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I hear you, but I think in absolute numbers, I don't think there are that many meme coin traders who are like making the calls. If you look at it, it's, it's broadly speaking, you know, the, you know, Coinbase users and people who have, you know, Bitcoin in their you know, IRA or something like that. It's not like, um, uh, you know, this is the, the bulk of the of the populace that's like you know engaging with crypto so I, I, right but, that but, at the margin it's nice but, but but the bulk of the populace is different than percent of populace that bothers calling their representative which is a much lower number almost <laughs> I mean, so almost, much lower i would assume that people who are like hardcore financial nihilists are probably not very politically engaged but <laughs> yes they're probably political to nihilists too <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. like you know no, you're but, probably but, but like they do care about they, they do care about you know? their wallet they care about the value of their wallet. Uh, yeah, true, true. Um, I don't. I, I. I. I tend to agree with Tom. I don't think it mattered that much on the margin, but, but particularly for SAB one twenty one, like this is very inside baseball. Kind of like if you're only big boys care about this, right? Like in and of itself, this is sure. not sexy I, legislation. I, I, this is also not something that most people are going to care about. Fit twenty one, which is this broader market infrastructure bill, which defines in large strokes, how crypto is going to be regulated, whether by the CFTC or SEC, pushes more of the jurisdiction to the CFTC and sets up a lot of different rules and, and whatever. And it was something we can talk about later when it gets uh, up for a vote. But that's a very different kind of bill that I do think affects almost everything. Whereas SAB 121 was kind of, you know, 
without real political activation, right? This, there was no big campaign around SAP 121. It's really all just, you know, look at the bill and see what makes sense. Nobody's scoring political points yet. That's what makes this seem so notable. What, what do you think is causing this um, flip though? I mean, A, just the legislative breaking with uh, the executive, but also it feels like this has really happened in the past three weeks, um, two weeks even. Like it feels just, I, I can't remember the time sentiment has, has turned 180 in, in such a quick amount of time. Um, I don't really know what's driving it. It's not that there's one um, you know, specific event or catalyst we can point to kind of, you know, in a, in a negative way, you can point to FTX as, as that. It feels like, okay, we have the ETF, the Bitcoin ETF. Great. Uh, we have this bad bill. Like, why now of, of all times? Th that's why I want to give the populists the, the little <laughs> bit of credit. All right. All right. Like, we had RFK come out today and talk about how right, he bought a bunch of GameStop, yeah, right? No, like, no, no. I, I think it's relatively, you know, obvious because it's being, at least from my circles, you know, the de facto explanation. And it's one I believe, and I'll just say this as a lifelong registered Democrat, <laughs> you know, Biden's poll numbers are terrible and crypto has emerged as a wedge issue that was looking like it was going to be an absolutely disastrous wedge issue for Democrats in that there's 40 million people that are pro crypto and a thousand people that are vehemently against it. And that is a terrible issue to take up. And this, this is one of the first unclaimed true wedge issues of the last like 20 years. Everything else in American politics is so rote and routine and the battle lines have been drawn and everyone knows how, how they work and everyone knows the calculus of it and everyone knows, you know, this social issue and that's economic issue and everyone knows the talking points. This is a gold mine of an untapped wedge issue that Trump came out for amidst really bad poll numbers for Biden. And it looked like it was just going to be, you know, one more advantage to tip the scales. And as a Biden voter, I mean, this is bad, right? Like, this is not what you want to see. You don't want to see the administration blow it on a wedge issue that could not only shape this election, but could also shape the battle lines of politics for the next couple of elections. And so, I think this is just politics. I think it's people waking up to the fact that the calculus of this was looking really boneheaded. And it was looking like taking a principled stand that was going to cost them dearly. And so, you know. I, I think also a lot of this was that, you know, you, I think you were mentioning, we were talking about this on the last show, the, the exact point you just made, that, um, you know, there have been a lot of polling numbers that have been released, but they're all from the industry. Right, so like you know, Coinbase has run polls, uh, Paradigm has run polls, and they all kind of say that hey, crypto is a real substantial populace that's going to vote on this basis. And if you're the Biden administration, you probably don't trust these numbers because you already don't trust the crypto industry, right? So you know that this is all kind of uh, uh, you know people lobbying you in the first place. And, but even uh, if you downplay it by an order of magnitude, they should be shocking yes. numbers. <laughs> I, I think I think probably what moved the Biden uh, administration was seeing Trump come out so strong in favor of crypto and saying, oh shit, Trump must have run the numbers and he must know that this matters. And so I can't lose this, wh wh however big it is, I maybe haven't done the polling yet, but however big it is, I can't afford to lose it outright. Yeah, most it just wedge doesn't matter that much to the base. Agreed. Most wedge issues are probably like 55, 45 in terms of like for and against it or like 60, 40, like, I don't know if crypto like looks like most issues. Like there's a lot of people who are financially incentivized to see this work and a very small number of people that are incentivized to see it fail. Right. So, okay, let, let's go from that to the E3 ETF. So you all might remember um, the E3 ETF, uh, the long history of people applying for E3 ETF, just like with Bitcoin, although obviously not as long since, you know, the first Bitcoin ETF was before E3 even existed. Um, but Bitcoin ETF got approved last year. Many people also filed, including BlackRock, for an Ether ETF. And it was widely thought at the beginning of the year that the Ether ETF was going to get approved under the same uh, rubric as why the Bitcoin ETF got approved, right? So, I mean, if you approve one, how could you not approve the other for, for, for spot trading? Um, then the SEC kind of started stonewalling everybody. There was no movement on a lot of these applications, and people assumed because of some of the noises that have been made in back rooms about them investigating the Ethereum Foundation that maybe Ether, they think Ether is security or something, they're going to make some weird argument to um, deny the Ethereum ETFs, and none of the um, issuer, none of the issuers were getting any feedback 
uh, which usually means that, okay, this thing is going to die on the vine. There's been no engagement from the SEC. Uh, and so uh, basically a, a few days ago uh, on poly market, the prediction market, they were giving odds of roughly 10% that the Ether ETF was going to be approved. And then all of a sudden yesterday, everything flips, SEC starts engaging. They start telling the exchanges, hey, um, we think we're, these are going to get approved, get ready. They tell the, uh, a bunch of the, the, the issuers, hey, please update your filings. Uh, and they give them a bunch of feedback. And all of a sudden the game is on. And it could be as soon as this week that we see Ethereum ETFs uh, get approved. Basically, we have till the end of this, or sorry, what is it, the 23rd? So in a couple days. 25th. The 25th, 23rd, whatever. Sometime this week. Sometime uh, this week. Sometime this week, uh, they have to give the response on the first tranche of ETFs. Uh, and we could have ETFs trading by the end of the month. Right now, Polymark is pricing it at 65%, basically under the belief that there's some chance that it drags or there's some kind of delay in the month of, uh, in the month of May. But more or less, it, now the market consensus is that Ether ETFs are going to get approved. Now, why did this happen all of a sudden? And the speculation broadly is that this is political. When something changes this fast, it's because... Somebody in a high up place said, hey, shit, we got a, we got about face. There's a problem here. Figure, figure out the details. And so this is probably not Gensler. This is maybe somebody above Gensler, such as perhaps the Biden administration, uh, that thought, hey, we can't lose people on this. If we are broadly perceived as being antagonistic toward Ethereum and the Ethereum uh, ETF, we're going to get even more of this stuff that we're losing ground to Trump on in the general election. Um, so Market is exuberant. Ether was up, you know, almost twenty percent a single day. Almost all alts have rallied on this basis uh, under the thought that okay, Ether ETF is coming. What happened to Bitcoin might also happen to Ether, uh, and maybe there's even more lying in wait after the Ether ETF comes in. But also broadly, that maybe this is uh, uh, presaging a broader reversal in Biden's stance on crypto, and that all crypto regulation might soften going into the the rest of the year. All, all I have to say is in a week where where we had the populist equities movement come back, it's kind of like... Come back. It did kind of die. It, GME it went up and, and then down. Today, Yeah, but then today it was another crazy day, right? Like, like I, I, all I have to say is, and they're also doing this crazy stock issuance. So it was only AMC that was doing issuance before. But anyway, the... The point I want to make is that it, it, you know, all of the things you said are like, okay, somehow Trump is leaning into this, and Democrats are now like, oh shit, why did we do this? Trump is leaning into it if you read his Truth Social or Twitter because he's very focused on a prediction markets, predicting him winning, and ironically, guess who is the likely person who is punting on poly market for this it's ironically your populist meme coin trader person right like if we're being honest it's it, it's a very overlapping demographic and so i actually think trump's numbers are coming from this sub demographic which already was kind of inclined to like him uh so 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 I, i'm not saying it's like a conspiracy so much as like if there is some numerical evidence and you know if you look at the only numerical evidence he seems to cite publicly it seems to be prediction market data I would, I would don't underestimate the value of this, this, how much of that's influencing this. And that, that's sort of like the kernel of truth at the bottom. Hold on, hold on. Can, you, can you, can you make more clear what is the insinuation you're making? Cause I'm not totally following. So, 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 so <laughs> if you, if you, if you spend a little time looking at truth social and looking at Trump's posts, which you right, do. His, his, his Twitter is, well, I mean, it's election year. You, you, he, Trump doesn't use Twitter anymore, basically, like realistically, right? Like, okay. If you want to get any idea of what, his base says versus Biden's and be objective-ish about it. You have to read both sides, right? And so sure, if you read sure. Truth Social, the no, he's constantly posting these poly market numbers. And that's how he, and especially he's around constantly, the like How often? Once a week. Oh, wow. I did not realize that. It, it, it's, and, and he loves citing this as like... Yeah, I've seen him cite it. I don't have to decide. I didn't know it was that frequent. <laughs> I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, I've, I it's, saw him cite it once before. I didn't realize it was in no, a no, week. No, no, no. He even cited it like today or yesterday so, so my point is he's he, he is like leaning into this thing and my guess is somehow that is what got him more into like i love crypto and the does he even is, know that polymark is crypto well he accept, he took he started taking donations of zero x and shib today so i, I agree but does he know that polymark it tom, tom tom tweeted about it so i'll let let tom let tom have I, yeah i mean to be to be fair Trump did the Trump NFT trading card thing, what, like two years ago? And it yeah, feels like true. really there's been this crescendo 
you know, in the past two weeks where the video came out of him meeting with the NFT holders at the dinner and saying, you know, hey, Biden doesn't even know what crypto is. I think crypto is all right. And so it feels like there's been this sort of this sequence of events leading up to this. It's not like, oh, immediately uh, Trump is pro-crypto. Now Biden is somehow pro-crypto or something like that. It's been sort of this, this slow movement. But um, I think, I mean, he's been playing it super well. I think the crypto donation sort of being the cherry on top. But I think, again, the question is sort of like, why didn't this happen earlier? And if anything, again, uh, with, with um, what's happening in, in Congress, what's happening um, with the Biden administration, potentially having this 180, it just feels so hollow and pathetic. It's like after four years of terrible policy, terrible enforcement, now all of a sudden we're reversing course for really no apparent reason. It's like, honestly, <laughs> fuck these people. Tom, uh, what? They, no, what? Let, let them do it. What the fuck? Why would you criticize no, them no, no, no. But, for but, but, softening but, on but crypto? I, do you want I, them to continue? I, 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 I will, I'm trying to claim that the domino meme, you know, the like the little domino that hits the bigger one and then it, it you know, yeah. the domino meme for all of this might actually be like prediction market traders, which no, 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 no. The domino, the beginning domino uh, uh, was uh, Polygon's think... BD team. No, that is the beginning domino. <laughs> Polygon's BD team is what created good crypto policy in the US. No, I, I just want, I just am saying this more because like, I think I if you read the Democrat tweets and social media, it's like a completely divorced set of numbers that they both are citing for why they're going to win. And the, 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 the right really loves citing prediction markets. And, and I think that that's a bigger difference than la even last election. I don't think it was something that showed up. Right. Remember that show we had on Futarchy? Yes. This is basically, this is that. Well, when did, a, when did we have a show on earnings. Futarchy? Well, so we you talked might have been out that day. Up. Yeah. That, so we had a few Tarky show. Yeah. <laughs> this, <laughs> about this, how prediction markets all, but, you know, but, decide but, the but world. I, I love this version of the world if this is true. Where so, like so the you're, you're almost imagining it's like reverse causality where it's like, um, <laughs> yeah. okay, the, an incremental dollar pushing the odds of Trump up on poly market, make Trump more pro crypto, which therefore sort of builds support yes. amongst the base. Versus it's the future Trump of lobbying. Yeah, yeah. We started with yes. the future of finance and we ended up with the future of lobbying. Well, we can't prove or disprove this theory, but I will no. just say it's not a completely unsound theory. There's some <laughs> grain. Thank you, <laughs> Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. You guys are a good team. You guys are a good team. Despite your political differences of like Robert being pro Biden and Tarun spending all his time on Truth Social. Uh, no, 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 really no. For the, for the record, for, for, the, for, the, for, for the record, like Robert, <laughs> I don't think I've ever voted non Democrat. I've certainly voted independent or green or whatever. But I've never, it's just that I don't believe in, you know, only reading one side of the news. I think you should read the mm -hmm. other side as well. Fair and balanced. Yeah. He's a fair and balanced. Guy. No, I respect no, no. That. I just I think that, I just yeah. think you don't understand. <laughs> you, you don't you don't understand the other side if you don't read what they're writing. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I, yeah. If, I, I feel like it, that that it's it, you have to go out of your way to. Do I it. look. I hear you. I think when it was around the election, I started reading a lot of Fox News. But I think but like, it, it is around. The I mean, election. It's, yeah, but no, dude, it's May. <laughs> I mean, like, are you, are you going to be reading Truth Social? For First the debates in June, Hasib. First debate yeah. is coming yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, I think you can kind of fall asleep for about four months and not worry that much about so Hasib, a true patriot, doing, doing yeah. his election diligence the night before. I'm just, I mean, I'm just saying, like, you know, the, the, all, like, I mean, this stuff is all just rhetoric, right? I mean, come on. Like, I, I don't really care how people campaign, but. It, Whatever, but it's rhetoric yeah. that influences things as we're claiming, right? In that the, it influences the, the battleground kind. states, right? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it look, influences, clear, the, the it US influences electoral bills. system is an absolute nightmare. It's completely fucked. No, no, but it influences these bill, bills on the fringe, right? Like th th that's kind it, of the it claim does. politics that's being made. does, right? Politics does. Yeah, yeah. So pay attention to the legislature. I think that's a good idea because that's where laws come from. Um, but you know, deciding what a president. I mean, you know, Biden ran on being a moderate. He's turned out to be like incredibly far left. And has more or less fumbled most of his campaign promises. So, like, the reality is that looking at what people do in campaigns is just not informative about what's going to actually happen over the next four years. I, I I don't think he's far left. I mean, I I don't. We don't have to make this a politics show. I don't think he's far left. I think on I crypto, it's being shaped by the absolutely worst members of you know advisory. And I think, I, like, in that sense, it's like. I would say his economic policy broken. is pretty far left. His foreign yeah. policy is not far left. No, I, I agree. I agree. We're on the. I agree. This is the closest we've gotten to like the MMT, you know, government. You know, we've seen in history. You know, but like aside from that, I don't think he's a far left president. Sure, socially and foreign policy is not far left. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Oh, I was going to say there's this interesting clip that was making uh, the rounds last week, and it was uh, former Speaker 
Paul Ryan being interviewed, talking about uh, U.S. debt, deficit spending, you know, what are we going to do? And the first answer he comes up with, not even talking about crypto, is stable coins. And stable coins being the, what, 12th, 16th largest holder of treasuries. And he's like, this is a way to, you know, offload our debt, create more, you know, treasury buyers, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought it was a very, frankly, impressive understanding of, of crypto. And like, it just feels like it was like one more sort of note in, in this, again, uh, sequence of events over the past two weeks. But as to why that is now uh, uh, sort of flipping policy, um, it just feels very bizarre to me. It's one of these things that's like, it, everybody kind of thinks it's going to happen. And then when it happens, everyone's surprised. So it's kind of like when it happens is surprising, that it happens is not surprising to my mind, mm. right? Like we've been saying this for a while that going into the election, being anti-crypto is stupid. And like, okay, it's, it's you know, uh, after FTX and no one's in jail yet. And, you know, we've, we've kind of done all the stuff, right? Like you put, you put SBF in jail, you put CZ in jail, you like sued a bunch of these companies. You've shown that you're tough on crime. The FTX uh, uh, creditors are getting all their money back plus some on top, you know, Modulo, asset prices, whatever. We don't have to talk about that. Um, so like Biden can now say, look, I did it. I was tough on crime. I cleaned up crypto. Now it's all nice and, and regulated. We passed bipartisan legislation to like, amazing. Yeah, I know. what a win! What that's a what they win! Should so be please doing. vote for me. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, and that's what yeah. I think. That's what you're going to see between now and the election is that he is going to make sure that he doesn't lose votes on this basis. He's not going to win the crypto crowd, but he's not going to lose the crypto crowd. I agree. It is a very down the fairway opportunity for good leadership and good government, which is actually extremely rare. Like going back to the point, this is one of like the last remaining wedge issues, like taking it off the table as a wedge issue and actually doing some good bipartisan governing would be a win for Americans. It would be a win for the administration. So here's the question then. Okay. Let's say that between now and the election, Biden chills out. He tells his attack dogs, chill out. Let's be nice. Let's not make anybody unnecessarily mad. Let's not get Coinbase to like send a push notification to everybody to call their senator or whatever. Um, okay, let's say he does that between now and the election and then Biden wins. Do you think he holds that line in second term or do you think he basically recants and says, ha ah, ha great, I'm elected now. Let's get back to business and shut down this industry. I think it's hard to predict because I think a lot of it comes down to who are the economic advisors and the people, you know, implementing economic policy on behalf of the administration? And there's a likelihood that a lot of that changes. You know, seeing from this, we'll call it campaign, how unsuccessful the current approach has been. And so I think if there's a turnover, then yeah, I, I think it'll be extremely, you know, interesting. You know, if there's not, then there's likely to be sort of these elasticity back to, you know, bad policy. You know, I think it doesn't matter if there's good common sense legislation that gets passed. It just sets clear rules of the road. And then we don't have to worry about what Biden's views are or what, you know, the SEC's views are or what the CFTC's views are or what the banking regulator's views are. You know, if we have bills on market structure and central bank digital currencies and like, you know, taxonomy and like all of these things, then what Biden's views are matter even less. And that's actually a good thing because then you don't really care whether Biden's pro crypto or not. And you don't really care if I mean, there Trump is, is pro crypto. 20 something percent chance that Dems sweep, like that they get control of the entire Senate as well as the presidency. So there's a, there's a real chance that basically like it might be tough to get bipartisan legislation before the election, but post-election, if the house flips, it might be Democrats writing all the legislation. But that yeah. being said, there were there were twelve Democratic senators who so it wasn't like oh there were two or three who crossed and it barely passed. Yeah. So I, I feel like, and they were also like from pretty populous popular like high yeah. population states and stuff. So it's like I I don't think it's like that easy to write off the way that it's been written off. And it's like I don't know how I don't know how many Hillary Allens in the world there are to like yell at Biden and like that he'll listen to anymore. Right? Like, well, I don't th I don't think. Hillary Allen yells at Biden. I think Hillary Allen yells at you know, everyone who works and writes the executive orders because she yeah. slighted so much in them. So I, that's what I mean indirectly. Yeah, I actually I, I tend to think that consensus is pretty sticky. I think if Biden sees that you know the Democrats are largely aligning on like, hey, we need to chill out on crypto, 
because, you know, it's, it's kind of up, you know, like you said, Robert, there are many, many different races and a lot of them are going to end up defining the policy for Democrats broadly. I think we're just going to see that like, Hey, the, 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 the consensus is more or less like calm down on crypto. And I think you'll probably just follow that consensus. I think these things are very sticky and they kind of, when they turn, they sort of turn all at once. And that feels to me like what's maybe happening to crypto. We're seeing the first shoots of that. Obviously it could be wrong, could reverse. If we get something else really bad between now and the end of the year, it could fail to hold on to that consensus. But it kind of feels like assuming that things more or less play out as they are right now, that we're kind of on a straight march to the, the consensus bipartisan is that we crypto's here to stay and like we got to stop trying to stamp it out. So we'll see, we'll see how that plays out. Um, hopefully by this time next week, we have an Ethereum ETF. And if so, we may see um, asset prices uh, continue to rally. But there's another story that's been getting a lot of attention, a big debate among many people on crypto Twitter about these things called high FTV, low float tokens. So let's describe what this means. So high FTV, FTV stands for fully diluted valuation. Basically means if you include all the tokens, including not just the tokens that currently are circulating, but all the tokens that could ever exist for a given coin. Um, the FTV is basically saying, okay, what's the market cap if you include all those tokens that will ever exist? So these low float high FTV tokens are basically these new tokens that have launched that supposedly have historically very low floats. So, you know, let's say a few percent, 5%, maybe even 10% of the fully diluted supply circulating, um, but a very large fully diluted valuation. So like 20 billion, 10 billion, something like that. Um, so uh, supposedly many of the tokens that have launched within the last six months on Binance have had this low float, high FTV uh, characteristics in their launch. And that cohort of tokens has done quite poorly. So if you, if you just look at like a chart of all those tokens launched in the last six months, they're mostly down into the right, um, you know, down anywhere from roughly flat to like down as much as 50, 60%. And if you look on the other hand at Bitcoin, Bitcoin's been up like 80 something percent in that same period of time. Um, Ethereum has also been up a pretty decent amount. Um, a lot of the big alt ones have, have done pretty well. Uh, and meme coins have done very, very well. But the, this particular cohort of these quote unquote VC coins, generally VC backed, uh, you know, the, the VCs and the teams own a high percentage of the total supply. Uh, these have done fairly poorly. So there's been a big debate on Twitter about what's causing this. Is this the VCs being greedy? Is this, you know, VCs dumping on retail? Uh, is this retail rage quitting and just buying meme coins instead of continuing to buy these, you know, VC coins that keep getting dumped on retail? Um, or, is it, or is it a problem with perhaps too little supply for there to be meaningful price discovery? Is there some market structure problem that needs to get fixed? So there's been a big debate. Many people are arguing about it. I posted something on Twitter over the weekend uh, that got a bunch of love. Uh, Kobe has posted some stuff about it. Kind of every VC seems to have an opinion. So Let's maybe just go around and get some takes from, obviously we're VCs, so we're going to have uh, perhaps biased opinions on this conversation. Uh, Robert, what's your take? High FTV, low float. Well, drama. let me point out the absolute granddaddy OG, high FTV, low float digital asset, Bitcoin. Bitcoin started off with an extremely small portion of the float growing over time in a semi-linear fashion, a decreasing linear fashion, but Bitcoin is the OG low FTV high float. Um, you can talk and justify for a lot of different reasons why that worked extremely successfully and how it's different from the current crop of low float high FTV tokens. You know, the current crop of low float high FTV tokens are things where, you know, Teams release a speck of them to the community, own 90 something percent, or at least whatever. And it turns into a mess because the whole project, so to speak, is just owned by a couple people. Um, and the increase in the float really just comes from them, not from other mechanics. Bitcoin at least was constructed in a far superior fashion in that. 100% of the increase in the float came from mining and proof of work. But Bitcoin is the first model. And at least there's a justifiable construct for low float, high FTV, which is you start off with 0% in circulation and it goes up to 100% slowly over time. Okay, but that's not what any of these projects are doing. No, right? like it's that's not. that's like OG fair launch stuff. Yeah, I think nobody really does that anymore. Like last person who did that was like Grin, and that was ages ago. 
Um, so what what do you think about the current meta Wait, Grin? of new no tokens way. that are launching? What are you, what are you talking yeah. about? All, yeah. all of DeFi summer, realistically, like the Wi-Fi type no. of stuff. No, no, no. They, no, no, no. Wi-Fi was like all the supply gets loose immediately. In like a week. That's not Yeah, that's yeah, not yeah like but it's fair launch. I, 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 I dispute yeah, yeah, fair the fair launch. launch. Yeah, yeah. Fair yeah. launch. That. Yes, yes, yes. The, the, there were many fair launches in DeFi summer, but yeah. they were not these Bitcoin style, you know, you start with 1% yeah. and you linearly- And it grows to 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not done much in DeFi summer. Correct. That's true. Um, so, so Robert, what's, what's your take on this latest crop and this current meta? Is there a market structure problem? And if so, what should we do? Well, I'll go, I'll, I'll preface by saying, I think every asset in every market deals with this market structure problem. Like there's a reason why- IPOs are structured in a way that are low float, high FTV. Okay. When there's a <laughs> IPO, only the IPO participants have their float. And then six months later, everyone can dump, right? Like it's similar in public equity markets in a lot of ways as well. And so I don't think we're like so far off base here as an industry. I think there's deep issues, like there's deep issues where some project releases 5% of his tokens and then does this like high five, we did it type situation. And that 5% trades for a ridiculous valuation because people think that that's the supply of the token. And then it's like, ha ha, there's 95% to go. And like, we're going to sell it into the market. You know, that's where there's issues. But I, I don't think it's the overall construct of, oh, only some portion of this is tradable today. Is that bad? I think there's a lot of corollaries that haven't turned out to be disasters that do work quite well. It's just, I think the way it's happening in a couple different projects, is just not working. I mean, the long-term dynamics of it are just bad. If it's like, okay, well, like, you know, there's going to be a high degree of inflation every single year, you know, like over four years, those four years are going to look ugly potentially. Tarun, what's your take? I have to do low float. Um, I mean, okay, what's the point of having that ratio of like high FDV, low float is that you have a subsidy, which is you're paying out as a, a either a block reward or a liquidity reward or, or, or for some action, like committing a resource, committing a node, committing hardware, committing liquidity, you are earning some usually pro rata, but sometimes not fraction of this emission and it's a form of a subsidy. And it's a form of a unique subsidy that doesn't exist in normal securities markets because normal securities markets don't have continuous emission, right? There's no there's a continuous emission of GameStop as a function of price. Instead, there's GameStop price goes up, GameStop management says we want to inflate the supply by X and tries to vote and push it through very quickly and causes the, causes the boom to crash. Uh, I think one very unique thing about programmable digital assets, which is, pretty much only crypto because most fintech fintech is lipstick on a pig and you can't do this type of stuff very easily is is that you can control these emissions and you can make them dynamic and respond to events right and so in bitcoin's case the emissions responded to hey we've produced too many blocks over a two week period we have a mechanism for reducing the amount by you know changing difficulty so that we hit a sort of target usage rate while matching this inflation curve in the case of Ethereum, it's like, hey, we have a target amount of stake we want to hit, and we lower the emissions as there's too much stake as a percentage of the total float. Now, the subsidy, the reason I bring this up is, well, the subsidy has to do something, right? And I think there's a very natural tendency, um, especially for those who are maybe not trying to build a real technology, but maybe want to copy pasta fork something, or they're just like, hey, I want to scam someone to just basically say like, look, this subsidy can make me rich quickly if I kind of like can, can sell some fraction of it quickly, but I never find a use case for it. The problem is if there's no natural reason for people to lock assets that are worth something, whether it's electricity in the case of mining, whether it's Ethereum in the case of proof of stake, whether it's storage in the case of Filecoin or Arweave, etc., then you have this problem that there's really no reason to hold it other than future inflation rewards. Right? You're, you're, it, it doesn't have any baseline collateral that it can be compared to. And so then it pure, it's basically a meme coin at that point, right? And so we, you know, if we look at this spectrum of things that are pure meme coins, 
there's no fundamental value of that you earn from locking a resource and potentially earning fees or a right to some future fees in the network. Uh, then you know the, the, these high FTV low float things are, are maybe they have a lot of marketing that is focused on their technology, but they're really meme coins and they're not actually like they don't need the subsidy. Like the network, the the service that's being offered doesn't need a subsidy. Either people are willing to do it for free or almost free. Um, or there's just no valuable long-term service, and it's just that the token is the long-term service. So then, at that point, then it it feels like a meme coin. And so I think the reason people are upset is uh, you know a lot of investors uh, funded a lot of infrastructure. Some of maybe the less less technically bright investors just copied other investors and invested in copy pasta competitors. As you go down the hierarchy of of the copy pasta ness. The the lower down ones don't need they they just don't really have that much of a need for a subsidy because they don't even have a real network. So what do they do? They effectively turn into these kind of weird meme coins. And so that's sort of what my point is: is that if you have this subsidy that you're p- planning out over a long time via some type of inflation emissions, you need that subsidy to really attract real resources, real services, real usage. And 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 if that doesn't happen. Then it's you know you you basically made a meme coin and I think it's the movie pass economy but for networks yeah okay so it sounds like what you're saying is that okay there's there's good high FTV low float launches and there's bad high FTV low float launches the ones that are the kind of one of one high quality you know they're the original tech team who came up with the thing those are okay but the fast followers those are basically meme coins and they're the ones who are ruining it for everyone. Is that I'm not the saying it's just argument? the fast followers. It's just that those are the easiest ones to point out when you look at their <laughs> emission schedule. <laughs> for, for you usage. to point out, or for or for like the the people who are mad to point out. Because uh, my sense for, is that the people who are mad are mad at everything, right? It's not just yeah, the, yeah, yeah. like no, 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 the I, eigenlayer I, clones. It's also eigenlayer. You know, it's not just no, no, the, no, no. I, yeah. I I don't disagree, and I do think part of the reason that there is this gap is that. You know, I gave you kind of the the Kipling esque story of like there's only two extremes. There's the the high FDV low float that's real utility in the long run, real network effect. You have to subsidize the network in order to get to grow, and then once it's sustainable, it survives. And then everything else is a meme coin. But in reality, there's a lot of gradations, and people have done a lot of things to play with this, right? Where there's like you have partial utility, but that utility almost doesn't need to be subsidized because your main net is almost a test net. It doesn't really have real fees. It doesn't really have real usage. And people aren't really locking it. People are getting sort of like risk-free return for some period of time before they're actually taking risk operating your network, right? Because like they're taking risk operating your network, you're subsidizing them. That's that's sort of like the fair trade. Um. And I think because of that, there's kind of this fine line where people are like, look, we're going to eventually launch and that eventual launch keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And now it's like, well, is it ever going to happen? And and I think that's the thing people are most kind of, it, at least my read of what people are saying is that that's the thing they're most angry about. It's like they, they effectively got this thing that doesn't work. Now... You could does argue not, that, bi- that does yeah, argue that, I, I'm not mad about this at all. Oh. I, I don't think that's what people are mad about, Tarun. I I, I, I feel like that's why people are mad about the the larger names, like especially I think I think a lot of the tweets this weekend were Eigenlayer, Celestia, Layer Zero, uh, 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 what am I, what's the last one? The one ZK Sync, uh, and most of the the failure there was like either a the network doesn't really need the token. Like it's like pure subsidy token or, you know, governance maybe token. Or the the way the token is used is like to attract capital, but then, you know, there's no way of getting liquidity on that capital. So that's the that's the one type of thing that people were unhappy with talking there. But my point yeah. is if you're an operational network, there should not be these liquidity constraints, right? Like I should be able to join and leave. I should be able to find an equilibrium. Okay, okay. So let, let me let me hear Tom's perspective on this, and then we'll we'll kind of complete the circle. Yeah, I I don't think people are mad at Celestia or Eigenlayer for like overly subsidizing the network. I think that the problem is, unlike you know in in ICOs where retail could buy in, um, by the time a lot of these projects launch, the 
uh, you know, uh, FTV or the market cap is is so high that there like just isn't enough appetite to um, have the thing go any any higher, right? So it's already priced to perfection. And in some ways, I I agree. I think first of all, like low float, there's a huge range there. There you have the one percent, you know, SAM tokens classically from from 2021, rest in peace. Um, and then you have uh, you know stuff like 10 percent, which is more in line with the IPO market. I mean, but but to be fair, part of the difference with an IPO market is uh, you know, it is not priced to perfection, right? It's not exactly, they're not trying to exactly hit market pricing. They are trying to leave like an IPO pop. And so, you know, people who are buying in feel like, oh, you know, this thing goes up, I got a good deal, whatever, I'm excited about it. And so it's this weird sort of market inefficiency where it's almost like you want to leave money on the table so that people who are buying in feel like there's still upside to, to have. And right now there just isn't that. Um, That's the invisible staking yield. Yeah, you, you, could, you could say that. Um, but I mean, overall, I um, I don't know. It, it's hard to get mad. I mean, I first of all, I agree. There's this boogeyman around VCs dumping. Most of these things are not liquid. VCs have multi-year vests, so no one is actually none of the investors, none of the team are actually selling the tokens. I think the problem is is straight up that just that like traders who are buying these tokens at these FTVs, it's just not sustainable. Like, this is way over where the market should be pricing these things, and they're sort of coming back down to with where they should be priced. And so I don't think anyone is really anyone to blame other than themselves. Or maybe something broadly speaking broken with with market structure as to like why there isn't you know earlier opportunity for retail to invest in these these products, but um, that's sort of a whole other can of worms. Yeah, so I got into a lot of arguments with people about this because I heard uh, first I heard of like a bunch of trader types complaining about this, and I'm like okay whatever, and then I heard a bunch of VCs also parroting this of like oh there's this big market structure problem, and then I was like this is stupid, this is just sensationalism, and I wrote this big piece over the weekend. Uh, more or less debunking what I see as the most popular theories of why these tokens went down. You know, so to Tom, as you mentioned, uh, it's not teams dumping or VCs dumping because none of these things have unlocked, right? None of these things are even a year old. So it's it's possible maybe some of them, you know, I've heard some stories about individual ones where, you know, they they have super short lockups, like these Chinese kind of quick flip type investments um, or places where, you know, maybe the team is hedging on perps or something like that. But if you look at the charts, almost all these tokens went down in April around the same time, which basically tells you there's no way it's coordinated dumping from every VC and every single one of these tokens. Uh, then there's also the story that retail is just buying meme coins now. And that's also not true. That's something that Tarun talked about a lot of like, oh, all the people who are buying meme coins. I pulled up the volumes on Binance and Binance, about 14% of the trading volume on Binance is meme coins. And of course, Binance trades way more volume than anything traded on chain. It's you know something like fifty percent of the total spot market is just Binance. Um, so it's true that there are a lot of people trading a lot of meme coins, and it's a brand new thing to be at the scale that it is now. It's way bigger than NFTs were on, on a trading volume basis, but uh, and way more people. But it's still the way more people is the crypto. thing. The way more people, way more people than and then we're trading NFTs. Yeah, that's then the we're thing trading that's, NFTs. And, and there's no incentive yes. to farm and Sybil comparatively. So those addresses sure. are more likely real compared, like you can, you can use address count as a much better. Well, uh, th that, I mean, I don't know about that, right? Like obviously it's a very, very big business to be, um, arbing these things and, and, uh, no, I, I think, yeah, but you can compare that to like normal thing, normal arb volume, like inflation versus like sure, things sure. where people are sibling it and like 80% right, of right, the right. addresses but I'm are saying, Hundreds of thousands of people in the context of global crypto markets is not big. The right. hundred thousand of people who are U.S. consumers is big. No, who are on chain? Young. I'm saying who are on yeah, chain. The hundred thousand yeah, yeah, people yeah. who are on chain. But yes. but I I think it's like a different demographic. That's like the it is it is clearly thing. clearly clearly very different demographic than the people who are trading on Binance. My point is that meme coins don't explain why these high FTV low float things are are happening. And then the third point that I made was that these tokens are not actually high D, high FTV low float. The FTVs are actually in a totally normal range. If you normalize for Ether price. Solana, AVAX, Near were all roughly in the same vicinity at the time that they launched as these new projects. Uh, and the floats are actually totally normal. So the float, the average float of that cohort is about 13%, which is very similar to what it was in previous cycles. It's also almost exactly the same as the average IPO in 2023, which is 12.8%. So th there's a lot of alarmism. There's a lot of desire to like pin the tail of the donkey and say, oh, it's market makers' fault, it's Binance's fault, it's VC's fault, it's KOL's fault. Because when markets go down, everyone wants someone to blame. Um, and I think the reality is that markets just went down for fancy, shiny new altcoins. And there's no 
bigger, beautiful, magical explanation. There's no big reform that needs to happen. It just markets are perfect at this. They just figure it out by repricing everything and making the numbers go down. So uh, my argument has been that I think everybody is freaking out um, for more or less for, for, for no real reason. And if there was a market structure problem, everything that we're describing was also true in 2022. It was also true in 2020. It was also true in 2018. So if it was a market structure problem, then it's been six years of this market structure. And, you know, it'd be weird for it all to suddenly start happening now. So, sorry, Tom, you were going to say something? I was going to say, speaking of um, arbitrage, you, you want to talk about our, our next story? Well, it's a rumor about address are being on chain. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we have time because I know uh, uh, we got we to wrap soon. We have um, to. We have to. We have to. <laughs> okay. By, well, by mandate of Tarun. Well, I, I have to hop. You guys can do this one without um, me. Okay, I, I right, literally right. have like a hard stop. I, I have to. Okay, all good, all good. All right, uh, yeah. Robert, we'll let you hop. We'll discuss this last story because Tarun really wanted to talk about it. Um, Robert, next week. Um, okay, so very briefly, we're going to talk about this uh, very weird, interesting story uh, about the DOJ charging two brothers in a $25 million MEV bot exploit, okay? This is the first time MEV has ever shown up in a DOJ indictment. So here's the story, very high level. We're going to move through this pretty quick because we don't have a ton of time. Um, so these two brothers who went to, I think, MIT, um, uh, both uh, software engineers, and, and uh, they both worked, uh, where did they work? I don't know, somewhere. Um, anyway, uh, there was a, an exploit in MEV Boost, which is the software that Ethereum validators run in order to extract MEV programmatically using a, basically an, an off-chain auction to extract MEV. Uh, if you don't know what that means, sorry, we probably don't have enough time to explain all of that on the show. But basically, uh, the, they were able to kind of go in, exploit a bug in this software to allow them to take these transactions that were supposed to be sent as a complete bundle and unbundle them, basically strip them apart and arbitrage some of the individual transactions in order to make a bunch of money. So they, they more or less uh, made this money, extracting it from other bots that were trying to extract money from other retail users. So it's a little bit weird, right? So you've got these arbitrageurs who are more or less trying to fuck over retail users or, you know, according to the DOJ, protect the integrity of the Ethereum ecosystem uh, by fucking over retail users. And these guys extracted their transactions, reordered them, and it basically attacked the attackers or, you know, sandwich the sandwichers or Robin Hood, the Robin Hooders, or I don't know, I guess not that, that one doesn't make sense. Um, but th that's more or less what happened. Okay, so this was uh, uh, covered, uh, I think, I don't know, like a year ago, um, $25 million that they made in this attack. Then they created multiple shell companies and private addresses and they tried to hire lawyers and they, they looked up, you know, extradition treaties and they basically knew immediately that what they did was probably legal um, and were Googling to that effect and all that showed up in the DOJ indictment. Um, so this indictment dropped uh, just about a week ago and everybody seemed to be very, very surprised that, hey, this kind of seems like, you know, sort of crypto and crypto violence, not the kind of thing that the DOJ generally concerns itself with. You know, this is not hacking a retail protocol. This is not North Korea. This is not anything else. This is kind of like maybe in the neighborhood of sophisticated players attacking other sophisticated players. It's almost like hedge funds, um, you know, screwing over other hedge funds or something. Uh, so people were a little bit surprised to see this. Now, clearly these people were exploiting a bug uh, and, and uh, you know, maliciously using this uh, and also trying to cover their tracks. So this doesn't really seem like they thought what they were doing was legal. Um, but it seems pretty surprising to have this kind of thing showing up in a DOJ indictment and the amount of sophistication that the DOJ showed in explaining what exactly is going on in these very kind of minutia corners of the, of the MEV market also seemed very surprising to people. Uh, so I was chatting with somebody who actually knows one of these two brothers. They like went to math Me? camp with them. I mean, um, I also well, no, know, you, I also you know also, them. <laughs> okay, yeah, you also know. Them. So I know somebody else who also knows one of these two brothers, like went to math camp with them, knew them, uh, kind of glancingly didn't know them very well and was very surprised to see them show up here uh, in a DOJ indictment. So Tarun, you said that you also know both the brothers or one of the brothers. I know uh, what's one your, of what's the your brothers. Take on the story? Yeah, I know one of the brothers. I also know the victim. So basically oh. the idea is the, uh, the there's a thing called a sandwich attack. And the very dumb way of thinking about sandwich attack is it's sort of your classic front running um, type of thing where someone sees your order and they see that your order, you're willing to fill your order until a price that's higher than the current market price. So they push up the price until the maximum that you're willing to pay in your order. Uh, 
and then execute your order and then sell back, which basically means they push the price up, they use your order to push the price up a little more, and then they sell back and so they 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 can get a profit. And so in automated market makers, it like Uniswap and, and things like that, this is a very uh, kind of relatively straightforward calculation of, of how to do this. Um, there's an argument that this is potentially good and bad, and, and we will get to that in a second. But um, basically, you know, a lot of people view sandwich attacks as sort of bad for retail in the same way that people view Citadel filling Robinhood orders as bad for retail. It's a very similar kind of thing. I think the difference is totally different. <clears throat> well, I mean, a lot of the wallets are selling order flow to searchers, so it, it doesn't feel yeah, that yeah, but that I, the, payment for order flow is more like just in time liquidity. Sandwich attacks, I think, are very obviously like I, exactly. I, I don't know. So, so this is why I find this this uh, kind of entire case a little bit weird. You know, when I worked in high frequency trading, a lot of trading strategies you do, the whole point is like you try to measure signals from book updates and also messages of like failed orders or guess what the failed order rate is. And based on that, try to find signals to do not so different things to sandwich attacks. So I, I would say market making has a lot of very similar strategies. So I, I think it's just more, you know, those are not very public where sandwich attacks have papers written by many people, including myself. So there's sort of like, it's a very, it's a very well studied thing. Whereas like, you know, these trading strategies that people are using aren't public. You know, I don't know if you if you follow the Millennium versus Jane Street trial that recently. That's a great example of this. Um, but anyway, so the idea is there's sandwich attacks. There's an auction uh, that is run um, every block where people pay for the right to get their bundle of transactions in. In fact, actually, people pay for that to get a block, and then people bid on whole blocks. And the person who has the right, the proposer, the validator, person running a node who's chosen, picks a block. Um, and so these these searchers, uh, the, these people who try to find sandwich attacks and then submit these orders, they they submit it to these block builders and um, kind of get their orders in. So the interesting thing is this is sort of a second order thing where like the people who are these uh, who are sandwich attackers got sort of sandwiched themselves. So someone was able to see all of their orders, r- break them apart, and push put them in the wrong order such that someone else made the money and they kind of lost the money. And so. Um, last year uh, at Ethereum Community Conference in Paris, um, at this MEV event, because uh, where I was speaking, because I've written a lot of papers on sort of formalizing this stuff, uh, this guy comes up to me and sort of starts talking to me uh, and is like, "Hey, like, uh, you have this paper that says sandwich attacks can be good sometimes because like they cause certain types of efficiency for liquidity providers and." Um, you know, I uh, I was a victim of this attack, and I was like, "You're the unbundling victim," which is this thing that the DOJ went after. Uh, and he's like, "Yes, you know." Also, first off, not a U.S. national, very much a EU national, um, which is why I thought this was a weird case for the DOJ to go after. Mm. Um, and he comes to, and he's like, "Yes, so I want to sue the people who did it because I've had got enough analytics between kind of." exchanges and other things who I was like, hey, this happened. Uh, and I sort of have a good idea who it is. Um, and I want to sue them. And But I need an expert witness uh, for to basically oh, say, wow. to basically can say sandwich attacks aren't bad, which is sort of my paper shows in some, it doesn't say <laughs> sandwich attacks aren't bad uniformly. Oh my, what? my paper... What? The shows so there's this this thing that says sandwich attacks are sometimes good. They actually sometimes they, you you the individual user might get a worse price, but the network at large, many orders might actually do better on average in some scenarios. And so he's like, yeah, I want to like make sure the the civil case doesn't view sandwich attacks as bad, but views sandwiching the sandwich attackers as bad. And he explicitly said this to me, and I was like, I have no desire to, to first off to to. to, to Oh, you didn't do this. Oh, I thought no, you were no, going to no. tell us that you were one of no, the expert no, 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 witnesses. No, 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 no. But I, oh, this wow. is how I, I got a lot of information on this. And then okay. James, who I'd actually then seen a couple times after that at some some research things, because he would go to a lot of MEV research things. James uh, so being like, one of the two brothers. One of the two brothers. Okay. Um, actually, a, a very funny thing is like James is a kind of a somewhat prominent and on an MEV Twitter. And I was in so many group chats where people were like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. And like, he's in the group chat and I'm like, well, you know, it's funny. No one could, could tell. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, so, you know, he was just, he was talking a little bit about this. Um, 
with me. And, and like, we, I remember we were talking about like speculations of how the person found the bug. Uh, so, so in hindsight, I thought that was very funny because, like, obviously he knows how they found it. Um, but yeah, I, I the weird part to me, and this is one of those things where I feel like the law and what's actually happening are quite separate. Is like, it, it, I I agree, all the stuff they did post talk to try to to hide the money probably is like really what got them in. But the stuff that they ex- exactly did reminds me a lot of things people do in high frequency trading and like. In, in like how they co-locate stuff in like how they like try to look at like which endpoints in the network are, are being used the most and then flooding them so that someone else can't send packets. Like there's all sorts of little microstructure stuff that the regulators definitely don't know about. Like I went to an Eric Budish talk at this conference I hosted last week and he was like, oh yeah, we just got the first ever cancel message data. I'm like, all right, you guys are never finding anything for another 10 years in terms of like what people are doing. Um, uh, but but like my point is like I, I kind of get this feeling that there's this like it, this thing was like a weird thing where it was so technically sophisticated that people were like it has to be <laughs> fraud. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas like I think there's a lot of other things that are much worse. But yeah, it's it's a very weird thing to be like this type of thing that you're doing to another user's transaction is not illegal, like the sandwich attack, like front running them. But if you violate the the front runner's desire of where they wanted to be in a block, you're suddenly it's suddenly like manipulating the the sanctity of Ethereum. That that part I still don't I haven't been able to wrap my head around the argument. And and I get all the other wire fraud stuff at the end totally makes sense. Uh, I, that I get that. But that's where I'm kind of lost. Yeah, I think this uh, that seems to be the general sentiment is like this feels like crypto and crypto crime. It seems like there should be a civil issue, not a criminal issue. Um, I think you know, a few points, as you were saying, one is this conspiracy component of, you know, hey, don't, you know, Google, uh, you know, wire fraud, statute of limitations or, you know, how to avoid KYC. Like, like clearly you knew what you were doing was illegal or you thought it was illegal. Um, and two is it, this feels very in the weeds. It's kind of like like order spoofing is also illegal, um, but uh, it's like not in a, in a um, um, criminal way. The I DOJ they, doesn't go after you get fined. Yes, yes, exactly. It's It's, it's, it's civil. I think really the issue here is like this this uh, exploit, this bug, right? Imagine if instead they had been operating a MedBoost relay and they were secretly malicious the whole time and they waited until, you know, someday in the future to take all the transactions that were being sent to them and unbundle them and include them in a block that they were proposing. I, in my mind, that doesn't s- s- sort of sound the same, right? Like you were giving these people information, they took it and they did something with it. There's no contract. There's no sort of... Um, you know, explicit agreement that this is how it's going to work. It was just you were you know participating in this thing, and, and that's it. Having the bug and then exploiting that feels like actually uh, uh, the the issue here. And again, what the DOJ is going after versus um, hey, you were sandwiching the sandwichers, or um, hey, you were you uh, you know had some sort of you know malicious PVP trade. Like that is not the issue. It's more this um, um, hack. And but again, it's like why is the well, DOJ one, even, one- even going after this? One reason I, I think this is different, and and maybe this is like a nuance thing, but in centralized systems, this type of hack can be very easily reverted, and you you kind of like roll right. back and pretend it didn't happen. And this happens all the time. Like you know when the 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 if you remember during the pandemic, like oil futures had this technically net negative thing. Part of that got reversed, right? Like that that wasn't like um, kept forever. Um, but in this scenario, there's a, it's actually sort of a weird probabilistic attack. In fact, the fix that was done doesn't fix it perfectly. Like it's just a na- it's the nature of this thing that it's like a latency race. And what it boils down to is if I can get enough information about the block the proposer chose before the rest of the network is able to get that block and confirm it, like they vote that hey, two thirds of people vote, two thirds of stake votes that this is the right block, and I can submit another block. And I'm the same proposer and flood the network with with that. And 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 yes, I'll get slashed because I proposed two blocks, but the slashing penalty might be much lower than the MEV I took. It, it, it still someday works. And all they did see, is adding this delay. Someone will take somebody, advantage of it. <laughs> totally, totally. Someday we're going to see somebody get prosecuted for doing a 51% attack. Just mark my word. That will happen. That, I mean, that's a good, point. that's a good, that's a good question, right? If, if you can get yeah. prosecuted for this, this is much harder than a 51% attack in some ways. Like it, it's right, much more nuanced. Right. I mean, I would say like, you know, uh, what is the difference between a trading strategy 
that's like kind of within the rules of the game and breaking the rules of the game and like, you know, smashing the piggy bank and taking a bunch of money out? And the answer is that it is purely socially constructed, that boundary. And what the DOJ is doing right now is constructing that difference. I, I will and, say, I feel like the victim, based on what he told me last summer and reading what the DOJ has, this non-US national was clearly involved in whatever the, the DOJ is. Oh, for sure. Uh, like for 100%. Sure. There's, no this way, there's no way they got this on their own. Yeah, right? yeah, This yeah, was yeah, fed yeah, to yeah. them. This was, this was 100%. This, like, I read it and I, and, and I was reading all these people on Twitter. Like, oh, this is amazing technical nuance. The DOJ must have all these crazy. I was like, no way. The, vic- <laughs> the, vi- the victim guy told me this uh, it last summer, like last July right. or August. Right. So, so, right. so it, I, I think almost all the facts were actually known minus the Google searches. Then. Yeah. So my, my get, I mean, look, we in order to get an indictment on somebody, you go to a grand jury, which is you know this kind of secret process where you present the evidence without the um, without the defendant being there. And grand juries love indicting people. Like it's very very hard to not get a grand jury to indict something. So basically, once the DOJ decides, yeah, we want to go after you, and we think this is going to be an easy case, uh, they'll just go do it. And if they've had a mandate of like, hey, go crack down on crypto crime, they get handed a case of like. Some smart kids hacked something and made 25 million. Yeah, sounds criminal. Great, go get it. And we got the case, you know, read, we got, we got, you know, we got the on-chain receipts, we got the Google searches. Like no judge or jury is going to hear this and not be like, wow, those guys are guilty as fuck. So the 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 kind of market structure yeah. of like, oh, isn't this just like Jane Street and Millennium arguing about blah blah? It's like, no, it's two kids and $25 million and like look at these Google searches and they're like trying to figure out if they can get extradited to from Dubai you know, like open and shut. So the reality is that a lot of law gets decided in effect by just like individual people doing stupid things where in the absence of a great case like this, probably it would still remain a gray area. And maybe if two hedge funds had gotten uh, uh, penalized for doing this, they'd have so much better legal representation that this would have ended up a civil case and the DOJ would never have gone after them. Yeah, but, I, I mean, like I said, the, the victim really made it sound like it was a civil case last year. Like 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 that they had enough information, they're going to sue these people, whatever. I, I actually feel like that makes total sense. Or even like a... Yeah, fine. yeah. I was surprised that it went to this level of criminal case when you see... You know, if they're doing this, I, I would say that there's a lot of other stuff that's going on in... in normal sure. markets that probably should be considered the same. Sure. I mean, look, I, I actually think that this is pretty fair game. Um, I think like, you know, black hatting MEV boost is just, yeah, you, you should, I think that's hacking as much as anything it, is it, 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 It's true, but it's a weird attack, right? It's like this timing attack. So it's, it's not guaranteed to work every time. Like there, there's a that, lot of nuance. I don't, that doesn't matter. Why does that matter? That doesn't make a fucking difference, right? Like, I mean, this is clearly not how the system's supposed to work. But, uh, but, but that's the same million. as me saying probabilistic finality. Oh, I accidentally forked and oops, that my no, fork suddenly. No. I think I, I mean, that's like, come on. This is like the trading strategy shit from uh, Avi Eisenberg, right? Like, come on. No, it, it, but like, this is much smarter than that. That was just pure, <laughs> like, come on, thing. like this is your this is your IQ bias making you feel that if the if the attack was very clever, well, it's also and elegant, I, I've met that he both deserves si- the money more. I've met both sides, and and yeah, and so I, I have I have sympathy towards okay. the ones who fair are enough. smarter of the two of them, right? Like, those. fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. All right, all right. we got to wrap. Um, that's it for this week. We'll be back next week. Hopefully, there'll be an ETF. And Marcus will be jubilant. Uh, but until then... I mean, they already are jubilant. They are, they are. But hopefully even more. Hopefully even more. Okay. That's it. Thanks, everybody. 